Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com, outsourcing surveillance like they outsource torture. But first, new tech aims to authenticate citizen journalist cell phone footage. We take this originally from Activist Post, but we'll begin with the press release from Florida International University. Cell phone video increasingly plays a role in reporting the news. From encounters with police in the U.S. to the fate of people worldwide threatened by terrorism and war, repressive governments, or any other number of man-made tragedies or natural disasters, individuals armed with mobile tech are capturing realities that might otherwise never see the light of day. But what if what you see is not what you get? How can followers of social media be sure that footage presented as real and unedited has not been manipulated or outright fabricated? Bogdan Karbonar, a professor in the School of Computing and Information Sciences, used those questions to launch his research into new technology to make fraudulent video easier to detect. Individuals equipped with feature-rich mobile devices effectively become the real-time eyes of the rest of the world, providing invaluable insights into remote, hard-to-access sites and events. Professor notes, in critical, socially charged settings, however, it's difficult to ascertain and assert an acceptable level of trust. Ideally, Carbonar says, both users and platforms such as YouTube would buy into the technology. Carbonar envisions the possibility of YouTube devising some kind of rating system or a stamp to indicate authenticity. Now, James, I mentioned we grabbed this article from Activist Post, and I think it's important at this point now that we've laid out the sort of press release that Florida International University is talking about to kind of call some of it into question. And Activist Post notes, in light of how an increasing number of people are calling into question the media presentation of what I'll just call controversial news events, you can insert the controversial news event of your choice, efforts at video authentication technology being undertaken at Florida International University do seem to be an important component of getting to the ultimate truth of what we see or believe we see when looking at, any, at, looking at what any media offers us. However, there is very little mention in the press release about who exactly will be doing that verification. Of course, GooTube rises to the top of the list. If we're going to call into question the source of video footage, we would also need to call into question the assumption that major media companies would be the correct outlets to do the verification project process, rather, especially companies such as YouTube and Google, which have already been pretty good in starving out independent journalism. It would seem wise that a truly independent third party should verify authenticity where citizen journalism offers to undermine major media's official stories. Now, James, what could possibly go wrong with having officially authenticated news footage? You saw it first. Well, it, as the, as that spiel from Activist Post says, I think it is important to have this in this age where, yeah, I mean, you really don't know. This is a cell phone video. Do How how do we know that it's authentic? That It is a step forward to have something to do with that. And if you go and read this press release, basically what they're saying is they'll match things like your cell phone's gyroscope data to the video itself so that it, they actually correlate. So it shows that the video really did come from the phone, that it wasn't just something you downloaded or you manipulated or edited after the fact or something like that. So that's, I mean, that is useful to actually verify that these are things that were really recorded. I mean, you can only verify to a certain extent, but still it's a step in the right direction. But I think the real point is who are the people that we are should be most afraid of uh, manipulating videos like this for political gains? It should be the big alphabet soup agents Agencies, the, the the governments who have the resources to marshal to doctor and fake the gyroscope settings as need be or what have you. You or I probably wouldn't be able to do that, but I'm pretty sure that uh, that the alphabet soup agencies with their unlimited black budgets would find a way around this type of authentication tech. So, I, I mean, it's good in certain uh, cases in, in limited situations, but I imagine that the real problem, the real problem of authenticity is not going to be solved by this. So, you know, again, take it for what it's worth. Well, and would it be what Elvis Costello would call watching the detectives? But James, isn't it really the real danger for something like this? Isn't Rita Katz and Intel Center? They're screwed, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> fake fake terror videos and the like. Like, hey, you, you recorded that in Langley, Virginia. We'll leave that for now there, James, as we move to our second segment this week on episode 251 of New World Next Week. The NSA metadata shutdown is a surprise, surprise, complete 
ruse. And we'll take this from a great article via the Rutherford Institute notes that for all intents and purposes, the NSA has supposedly ceased its bulk collection of metadata from Americans' phone calls, but if you actually read the fine print, nothing is going to change. The USA Freedom Act, which claimed to put an end to the National Security Agency's controversial collection of metadata from Americans' phone calls, was just a placebo pill intended to make us feel better and let politicians take credit for reforming mass surveillance. In other words, it's a sham, a sleight-of-hand political gag pulled on a gullible public desperate to believe that we still live in a constitutional republic rather than a down-and-out, out-of-control, corporate-controlled, economically impoverished, corrupt, warring, militarized banana republic. On any given day, the average American going about his daily business will still be monitored, surveilled, spied on, and tracked in more than 20 different ways by both government and corporate eyes and ears, the difference of which I'll leave up to you. More than a year before, politicians attempted to patch up our mortally wounded privacy rights with the legislative band-aid fix that is the USA Freedom Act. Researchers at Harvard and Boston University documented secret loopholes that allow the government to bypass Fourth Amendment protections to conduct massive domestic surveillance on U.S. citizens. It's extraordinary rendition all over again, only this time it's surveillance instead of torture being outsourced. In much the same way that the government moved its torture programs overseas in order to bypass legal prohibitions against doing so on American soil, it's doing the same thing for its surveillance programs. By shifting its data storage, collection, and surveillance activities outside the country, the government's able to bypass constitutional protections against unwarranted searches of Americans' emails, documents, social networking data, and other cloud-stored data. Heck, the government doesn't even have to move all its programs overseas. It just has to push the data over the border in order to circumvent constitutional, constitutional and statutory safeguards seeking to protect the privacy of Americans. So, James, credit for this particular brainchild goes to the Obama administration, which issued Executive Order 12333, authorizing the collection of America's data from surveillance conducted on foreign soil. So, using this rationale... The government was able to justify hacking into and collecting an estimated 180 million user records from Google and Yahoo data centers every month because the data travels over international fiber optic cables. The NSA program, dubbed Muscular, is carried out with our good buddies in British intelligence. So no wonder the NSA appeared so unfazed about being forced to shut down its much-publicized metadata program. It had already figured out ways to accomplish the same results meaning spying on Americans' communications illegally without being shackled by the legislative or judicial branches of the government. Now, James, the article does go on, but I'll leave it by noting that this metadata collection now being carried out overseas is just one small piece of the surveillance pie. James. Lay down your weapons, citizen. You are not under attack. What's with the tanks? Why, why have you got the guns there? You are not under attack. Just lay down. Uh, yeah, this is a pretty basic ruse, isn't it? Don't worry. Don't worry. We're stopping. J just don't even think about it. Okay, you, you've been exposed. Oh, you caught us. All right, we're going to stop all that stuff. Don't worry. Don't wor worry your pretty little heads about it. It's all done. Um, I really do hope that most of our viewers will be able to see through a blatant ruse like this, but... I, it's interesting. I've even had emails from people this week saying, well, what do you think about this? It looks like we won. No, no, uh, we didn't win. Uh, this is not an over and done with fight. It's a complete lie. The Five Eyes system is still in place and they will still share intelligence around the, the Five Eyes system. Oh, you, you spy on us, we'll spy on you. We'll share the data. So it's not coming from us. I mean, there's a million ways to get around this. And uh, this has been baked into the cake ever since this Freedom Act was first proposed, let alone passed. So um, yeah, do not lay down your arms. It is still, the battle is still ongoing and uh, we still have to, uh, to let other people know because I'm sure there are a lot of people who have been placated by this and believe that, oh, that's all been done with, uh, over and done with. Well, it isn't. It, the, uh, they're still surveilling you. It's still going on. In fact, it's much more than metadata. It always has been. It's about collection of actual emails, actual phone calls. They have the records. Uh, we have to expose that and, uh, and continue fighting against it because the, the battle is not over. Well, and that reminds me of even what we just kind of talked about last week in a somewhat more fun way about how, you know, tracking your cat photos by the, the geolocation data that's right in there. And again, and myself, I had to go back to one of my slave devices and go, 
I'm not doing that, am I? And look, and oh, of course, you're adding that data because with every update, whether it's an app or the the OS that you're running, they're going to opt you back into that stuff every single time. So every time you update any kind of apps, you always got to go back and double check that you're not throwing out all your data to everyone again. They always make you opt out as opposed to opting in. So having said that, James, we'll move to our third and final story this week. And I think that's quite the menu flows from one, two to three. And we'll call this hashtag good news next week. Hopeful edition. Could the Third Amendment be used to fight the surveillance state? This is from Ars Technica. The Third Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is just 32 words. Quote, no soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law, end quote. Amongst very nerdy constitutional law circles, the Third Amendment is practically a joke. It's never been the primary basis of a Supreme Court decision, and it only turns up rarely in legal cases. The reality is that the federal government isn't going to be sending American soldiers to individual homes anytime soon. Cross our fingers on that one, Ars Technica. Even The Onion tackled the issue in 2007. Third Amendment rights group celebrates another successful year. But in a recent op-ed in the LA Times, one California state lawmaker, Assemblyman Mike Gatto, proposed a novel legal theory that could allow this amendment to fuel a major legal challenge to the American surveillance state. Let's examine, this is from his op-ed, let's examine where a case may be made. The National Security Agency is part of the Department of Defense and therefore of our nation's military. By law, the NSA director must be a commissioned military officer, and per its mission statement, the NSA gathers information for military purposes. That's strong evidence that NSA personnel would qualify as soldiers under the Third Amendment. And why did the framers prohibit the government lodging soldiers in private homes? Besides a general distaste for standing armies, quartering was costly for homeowners. It was also an annoyance that completely ex- extinguished a family's sense of privacy and made them feel violated. Does that sound familiar? Now, as Gatto acknowledges, the Third Amendment has hardly been litigated in the history of the Republic, and he figures that civil liberties groups like the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the American Civil Liberties Union have yet to strike a crippling blow to the government in their myriad legal challenges under the First and Fourth Amendments. James, this is probably a little bit pie-in-the-sky hopeful, but I think it shows just how many different ways we're looking to sort of play their game by their rules to win one for us if i can put it in simple stupid terms james right yeah no i get what you're saying and as stranger things have happened i don't know they got al capone for taxes you never know maybe they'll get the nsa for the third amendment um i'm not opposed to people trying novel ideas like that but uh it would still be a bit of a pyrrhic or hollow victory even if it did actually uh, amount to anything because the real point of this is the first amendment the fourth amendment the the fundamental rights to to free speech to uh, uh to not be randomly searched without warrant those are the the real issues here. So if you get it from a kind of side angle, then it still leaves that that uh, piece of the pie open for future dictators to gobble up. Um, I, I see. Yeah, I mean, if it works, great. I mean, try it. Why not? But I think probably the best idea that I've seen yet, rather than playing their game by their rules, is to not play their game, to in fact take the ball and go home, uh, nullify the NSA. And I had a podcast about that. Uh, if Utah got on board and shut down the water and the energy to the, the data center, what an amazingly interesting thing that would be. And uh, setting up a fight with the feds and potentially shutting off their uh, their surveillance by flipping the switch. I mean, how awesome would that be? So I, I think that's probably more to the issue because, again, that's about taking power back to the local level rather than uh, just basically giving all your power over to the feds. Um, but still, you know, I mean, it's it's something new. It's some way to keep this in front of people's eyes at any rate so that they, they know that it is still going on. And just because the NSA has shut down their metadata program doesn't mean that the fight is over. So, James, we try and follow and give people good news, and we've been doing it all through 2015. And actually, behind the scenes, I'm prepping good news next week. I'm planning on launching it as soon as the calendar rolls into 2016, working on some graphics and some other things. But one other note, hashtag good news next week. Russia bans the Soros Foundation as a, quote, threat to national security and constitutional order. That got the tweeters going. And some of the other stories we're watching with the classic hashtag new world next week. James, we possibly could have done a whole segment on this, but there's a lot to get into. And like anything, we'll leave you the links and go do more research because now it's been a lot of years 
Sandy Berger, the man who stole documents from the National Archive about 9-11, shoved him up his pant leg. He's dead. And, they're t- of course, they're singing his praises, and, oh, he built Clinton's foreign policy, and I'm sure this will play into the, the Hitlery campaign building, but we'll include uh, as well a couple of flashbacks about what Sandy Berger stole and why. And some of the other stories we're looking at, War on Terror fails slash succeeds as terrorism deaths skyrocket and Greeks told to declare cash under the mattress, jewelry and precious stones. We have been following those kind of stories for quite some time here on New World Next Week, James, and we will continue to do it, my friend. And I'm looking forward to seeing good news next week, next year. And once again, people can subscribe to your YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Media Monarchy. And we'll leave it there. James, thanks again. Thanks, buddy.